Hi, everyone, and welcome to Living Well with Dr. John, Adjustment Through the Lifespan. Before we begin, I'm going to read two webinar disclaimers. The first is, this is for educational purposes only. For psychological services, please contact your state psychological association for referral. The second disclaimer is, the questions, comments, and opinions expressed during this webinar may not express the views and beliefs of the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. Now for some background on Dr. John. Dr. John Chang is a clinical psychologist and is board certified in rehabilitation psychology. He is a professor of psychology at East Stroudsburg University, as well as a consulting psychologist. Dr. Chang also has a private practice through Doctors on Demand. Two quick notes before we begin. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Reef Foundation YouTube channel. Also, if you would like to ask Dr. John a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. After putting your question in the Q&A box, please raise your hand if you would like to go live to ask Dr. John the question yourself. Now I'm going to turn it over to John. Hi, John. Hey, Kaylee. Thank you for the intro as well. Hi, lis uh, hello, listeners. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you, the foundations, Christopher and Dana Reed. Thank you, Angela, for allowing me to come on once a month to, I don't know, talk about tough things about our our lives and uh, you know, there's, I get a lot of different questions and I try to imply or at least integrate what I know personally and professionally in hopes that some of this educational material would help our listeners out there. One of the things that I, I, I've noticed is that I'm always trying something new. so. You have to let me know if I'm if we're doing it right, doing it wrong. Uh, the goal is always to to educate, to entertain, uh, to make this worthwhile. Because you are spending your time with me, you're spending an hour of your time, your life, and I want to try to make it worthwhile to you. So, so please let me know in your comments when you want to, if you think something is working for us. Um, so again, thank you for the foundation. Thank you, Kaylee, for helping me set this up. And thank you, for Angela, for guiding me to make sure we're doing the right thing. So uh, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, autonomic dysreflexia. Uh, we're gonna talk about aging issues. Uh, we're gonna talk about n how not to be a burden, although that's, that's always a tough one as well. Uh, so we're, we're gonna just run through a, a couple different things. We are, Hoping do we're also hoping today to have some guest questionnaires on today live and Kaylee, do we have our guests today? I'm gonna double check. Okay, awesome. So, um, so first of all, you saw in my little flyer that one of the things that I get incredibly frustrated and it's almost to a point of annoyance um, for me and, and definitely for my wife is that I, I get these autonomic dysreflexia issues like all the time. And I, I wake up in the middle of the night and my head will be bursting or blood pressure will be elevated over 200 and or um, you know, it'll happen right there in the day. You know, not, it's always inconvenient, but it is like the worst timing when I get it like five minutes before I'm supposed to see a patient. And I'm like, what the, and, you know, so I, I, so I have to go through my requirements or my thought process of, okay, okay, is it the bladder? Is it the bowel? Is it, you know, I go through my checklist and you're trying to do that while your head is exploding. Um, it, it, it's just incredibly difficult. And it's, it's always got to a point where it's, I'm always afraid of that my wife is gonna be gone because she's like my go-to person. I'm afraid that I don't know what to do or no, no one knows what to do um, when I have these symptoms. So, so, so I was reading some of the questions that was coming through and um, and we have a person named Misty. She is 
going to come on right now. I figure you're probably tired of hearing me talk all the time. So I'm going to get people who are probably that knows things a lot better than I do for many of these things and maybe share her experience a little bit. So can we get Misty on uh, for a sec and see if she's, a, she's available? Yep, I'm here. Misty, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for being on um, Dr. John's show here. Uh, okay. Appreciate that. So do you mind asking me or telling me a little, actually tell me a little bit about yourself? Okay, so yeah, so I'm a C12, complete quadriplegic, almost June 1st, I'll be 19 years post, um, and motor vehicle accident, some basic stuff. Yeah. Stuff, nothing exciting. <laughs> Right, right. When I when I think of C one two, I'm I'm thinking of Vendler dependent, correct? Uh, yes, technically. So during the day, I have something called the phrenic nerve stimulator that I'm on during the day. It's almost like a pacemaker for your diaphragm, and okay. then at night I go on the ventilator. Wow, wow, that's it's great freedom. Yeah, do you? You know, my first question is that my thoughts are: Do you have a backup system? A generator? No, I need to. We've been always talking about it, but I've never had an issue yet of power outages and everything. I'm here in California and I don't get electricity from PG E, so I'm pretty lucky that way. <laughs> that way. <I> guess. <laughs> yeah, that I, that's because I guess that's my the first things I now you you wrote in your question that you have AD now, right? Or you have some episodes of AD once in a while? Yeah, it used to be like very infrequent. Or when I did have it, I would know it was just my catheter because I do have a super pubic. So I just mm -hmm. make sure I have my gagger checked. There's a kink, you know, what's happening with that. And basically it would go away automatically. It wouldn't last very long, not very long. But just recently, back in the end of February, I had some really bad case of it, which Last like a couple of days, I stayed in bed because I couldn't move. I would just, my blood pressure would shoot up. And finally, it's like, okay, I need to go to the hospital and figure out what's going on. Right. And it's right. Turn. And it's like, I'm, you know, almost 19 years post, and I don't know what the heck has happened all of a sudden because now I'm on high blood pressure medicine. I'm on a low dose, but I used to take low blood pressure medicine, Minadrin, uh, every time I got up. And now I can't even take that because my blood pressure is higher. So. You know, when I read that, I was like, wow, you're going through the same thing as I'm going through because it, it used to be, like, as you stated, when you were young, uh, when I say younger, I mean, early on in your injury, we had low blood pressure, right? Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I, even when I ate, I would have to stop eating for a second because the blood pressure would drop there in the middle of the meal. And yeah, you could tell. Yeah. Yeah. So you could tell. And last two or three years for me, I've all of a sudden have high blood pressure now as well. And, and that change, that change, you know, is, you know, as I read, or as I'm learning, is just part of that progression of growing older, you know, with our disability. It you know. seems like it's just incredibly frustrating. Frustrating. We can't figure Absolutely. out what's going on. Yeah, you know, I'm not a medical doctor out there, people. Mm -hmm. I'm a clinical psychologist. So my, my comments and my suggestions are always based on from a psychological perspective. You know, the reality, at least for, it sounds like for at least Misty and I and many of, of our listeners, you know, as you get older with your disability, as you get older with your, uh, your spinal cord injury, your ability to adapt and adjust, it seems, at least physiologically, seems to be harder, you know, and mm -hmm. it, the, the, you know, yeah, I, I take it to when my students do an overnighter, or like I used to when I used to study and stay up all night. I can used to do that the next day, and they're like they they they're fine. Now I, I can't do an all night without being dead for like three days because you know I'm just mm -hmm. older. And it sounds like your body and my bodies are doing the same thing. We are exactly. I remember doing the same thing as so. I forgot to say that I was 17 when I was injured, and now. I'm 36, almost 37, but even then, I mean, I'm not that old to have high blood pressure, I feel. No, you're a young chicken here. 
you know, 37. Sorry, I don't have an answer for that. Oh, I'm sorry. My Alexa is talking. Um, but yeah, no. And so you're 17 years post and you're already noticing that you're, you know, gradually having to readjust to how you used to do things. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that even with weight, I used to kind of stay at the same weight or I was at to drop the weight a little bit. It's like, but now I don't know if it's COVID, but it could be COVID, but it's could also be my age plus injury. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you, do you see yourself gaining a little bit more weight? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I'm, again, I think a lot of the listeners out there who are, you know, been, who are, have been injured for a little while knows that the, the weight does come on all of a sudden. And, you know, that's a normal progression for no, most people that are able-bodied, but even for us, it becomes even more drastic uh, for us. So, uh, you know, I do have a question for you. How do you cope with your everyday life? You know, what is the what is your go-to thing that you tend to do that you know to work around? Are you? Um, I am just generally a very positive person. I don't let a lot of things like get me down, or sometimes I'll frustrate me, and then I'll have to like you know be like, no, it's okay. I can just get over this. It's fine, you know. So I find a lot of like. I'm on my computer a lot, and so I talk to different people, different people, and I find help in helping others almost, you know, and helping new people that are yes. injured and like that, and that helps me almost, you know, I guess almost feel better about myself, but not, you know, I'm glad that I'm able to help people with what I can, you know, my experiences, so that helps me. Okay, great, great. So, so the fact that you, you, well, first of all, I heard that you're you're generally an optimist, so. That's so you have a good attitude right off the bat as a personality sounds like. And then, yeah. you know, the fact that you are able to be on a computer and as to help others, you know, walk through this situation that in turn helps you. Exactly. Yes. Wow. Great. Great. Well, I, you know, thank you for being on and, and, and asking the question. I appreciate you giving us your, your knowledge and experience about these issues and, Again, Misty, thank you again. So, you know, listeners, thank you. Thank you. And, and listeners, as you heard, as for myself, autonomic disrespect is a, it, you know, it is something that you just don't not want to play around with because, you know, as I was researching the, the different type, I mean, there are medical tr surgical treatments. And again, I'm not going to recommend any. I'm not going to, I would just, talk a little bit about there are pharmacological treatments sort of like what you and I or at least myself and Misty's are going through you know taking a blood pressure medicate you know to get it down some people take minadrine to take it go up uh, I try to go through the steps of okay first thing I do is learn about it you know learn as much as about as much as I can about second thing I do is I go to a professional it's like all right, are there professionals out there who are going to be able to teach me something? You know, like listen to Nurse Linda on her podcast monthly and, and, and read through the Christopher Foundation's website. They have tons of information on these things and try to see, okay, which one can I try? Uh, which medication? And it's, it's pretty much, they're going to try to give you different things to try. And it's not a perfect thing for everyone. And so as a, as a psychological perspective, one is education, two is getting the right contact, and three is trying the different aspects of it. Now, I'm going to tell you what I'm saying as a psychologist, as a person with a disability, it's going to be a similar way of tr way I treat almost everything. See, the fact that you and I are still have a functional brain. It doesn't matter if we're a quadriplegic, a paraplegic, for a ventilator dependent or not, or not. We have to go through the same process of trying to figure out how to manage these issues. You know, as I read through all these questions that a lot of people struggle with, bowel, bladder, skin, uh, relationships, intimacy, you know, it's a matter of using that thing between your ears 
as the first go to, you know, sometimes they call it a muscle, technically it's not a muscle, but you know, that brain of yours to solve all these issues. You know, I believe I am biased. You know that I'm truly biased that your brain is, is the way it's gonna solve this issue. It's not gonna solve the fact that we're paralyzed. It, it is not gonna solve many of these things, but can we restructure it in a way that it makes sense to us? Um, you know, I think Tom here writes, it says, do you feel it's healthy not to be concerned about positive, possible negative outcomes of AD episodes or simply unhealthy denial. And Tom, you're right. It, this is truly an unhealthy denial if you ignore AD. And I don't know, as we, when I was younger, I did not have to worry about these things. You know, the first, man, I'm 33 years post. First 20 years at least, I, I, I don't even remember thinking about these things, uh, about AD. And uh, because it was, you know, you sweat when you're on a, on a toilet there. Absolutely. When you're doing your digital stim and, you know, you, you go through, but it doesn't last long. It, it and in an hour or two, you, you move on. But now when it's so persistent, you know, as you get older, then um, it just makes it a little harder. Um, so I'm gonna shift gears to talk about the psychology of growing older. Okay, we're gonna, uh, psychology of aging. And, you know, it, it means so much more to me at this point in my life than when I was younger, obviously. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about in my classes is uh, when does, uh, when do you start thinking about, okay, what is the meaning of life? What have I done in my life? You know, that midlife crisis concept that seems to hit everybody in their forties or mostly in their fifties. And to me, it hit me when I was, well, excuse me, this is the problem of, of working from home. The, um, I apologize. The, so, when I was going through my review and going through my educational process you know, around 37, 38, I, I real I found out that, you know, our lifespan is not as obviously not as uh, long as most others. And usually midnight crisis is when you realize, Oh, you're not going to live forever. And so it hurt me, hit me when I was around 37 and say, look, I got to do things that make my life meaningful. And, you know, and as I read through some of your questions, many of you want to prepare uh, to be, to grow old better as best we can. You know, I, you know, I read something like this, uh, Catherine, you know, I'm not going to name people from what state they're from. I'm going to try to keep people from keeping their uh, state private now. So Catherine writes, having become a paraplegic in my early seven, in my early 70s, I would like to be more, learn a little more about older individuals adjust to their loss of the independence and isolation due to SCI. I'm extremely grateful for having lived a very full life before SCI, but it has been difficult to adjust to many changes caused by SCI. You know, so Catherine has sort of double whammy here. You now, many of you who uh, you and I who are early injury traditionally used to be 18 to 30 years old, young males, 80% of us. You know, now the demographics has drastically shifted. You know, the average age of injuries now is around 43. And now we see a large group of older individuals who get hurt um, from either medical issues like spinal stenosis, or just simple trauma, falling. Um, and so Catherine here has a double whammy of not only being 70 when she had her injury and then now dealing with the paralysis 
uh, at that time. Well, Catherine, my recommendation, or as you know, based on literature, is, is that and my past experience when working as a gerontologist, that was my formal, you know, postdoctoral fellowship was in geriatrics, is that you have to take on all the, the wisdom that you've already learned um, getting to 70, uh, the ability to be patient. I mean, being patient is one of the key things that in survival, having paralysis, especially when you're at the levels like myself and up where you have to rely on people to do everything for you, which is incredibly frustrating. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that a little later. But so patience, um, having the appropriate social support, uh, being active. And when I say being active, I mean getting out there and engaging um, as much as you can in seeing people. Now, Catherine lives in an assisted living facility already. So, so I'm seeing that, you know, for you, you have people around you to engage, socialize, and to be involved in your life. You know, there's, there's some studies that show that even though higher level injuries like us, myself and others in comparison to paraplegics, they have it rougher, uh, especially when it comes to suicide even, it, 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 higher rates for paras and quads. And one of the theories they write out, they think is that because we have people around all the time. So we're always engaged, we need to have people around. So, so socializing, engaging and finding, you know, finding meaning through our relationships that way. You know, you know, she, she writes, I have wonderful professional help. You know, that is so inconsistent. You know, I'm so glad for Catherine that you've had found people around that understands you know, your injury and, and can help you professionally. Because there's a lot of people out there who like, like myself at times, we're with professionals who have no idea what to do with spinal cord injury, let alone autonomic dysreflexia. Um, my God, have that little card with you. Uh, I get it from the foundation, that little autonomic card that it's uh, laminated, it's, I stick it in my wallet, I hand that out every time I see a doctor and it says, look, this is something that may happen, you know, if, if we're, uh, especially if I'm dealing with my bladder, you know, and here are some of the recommendations on treatment uh, when my blood pressure goes over 150 or diastolically and, you know, so things like that. So I always had that little card with me. Um, uh, you know, Karen, you know, writes, I want to age independently, you know, what does that mean, aging independently? You have to really figure that out and define that. Because like, for example, I'm in charge of getting the oil change in the, in the, in the house. Now, you and I know I'm not changing the oil. I, I get it arranged. I, it goes to the garage and someone does it and comes home. Is that independent? Am I doing that independently because I'm arranging coordinating that or is it technically physically I'm not really doing that so if independence if you're saying you want to age independently means that you want to be able to be in control of your life I'm going to say Karen absolutely that is a great perspective that's a great way to change how you see the world but if you say I want to age independently without in the need of someone to physically assist me, you know that's not gonna happen. Even if you didn't have a disability, that's, you are going to need physical help as you physically you know, become weaker as you got an older. So, so it's really important. Now, some people write, well, what, what, is, what is aging with spinal cord injury? What does that mean? Well, and what I've learned so far, being that you know, I'm in my 50s already, literature shows that the first 15 years about of your injury, and those who are beyond 15, made me to, you know, let me know on, on the chat if this, if this worked 
or this was your pattern as well. But the literature says, look, the first 10 or 15 years, you're pretty good physically. You're going you're gonna to be stable most of the things. And, you're, and you don't really worry about your physical stability. What you go to bed the next morning, you're going to have. What I noticed that for me, it was in my 20, after my 20 saw some odd years of injury. But the literature says after 15, you're going to start to notice more and more chronic illnesses to be an issue. You know, from arthritis to joint issues to, uh, to skin issues, bladder issues. So, so you have to psychologically almost prepare yourself that, you know, once you get past 15, there may be some more prevalent things to think about. Um, it's, you know, you have to compare us to what normal aging. Normal aging, you have these deteriorations already. So for us, people with spinal cord injury, it's just so much more. So we have to adjust to it. We have to prepare for it. Your doctor's got to prepare you for it to, you know, make some of these adjustments and maybe do some things to prevent them. You know, it seems like based on literature that we're, people like me who are, we are going to experience a lot of the symptoms that the older individuals who are 20, 25 years ahead of me just chronological age. That's what the literature says. So that sucked. That when I read that, I was just like, oh man, that that's not, I'm not looking forward to that. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna read another question that was similar to about aging. It says, it says, Joe, Joe says, I am 42 the high level incomplete SCI. What measures should I take to start preparing me for aging with an SCI? Uh, six months ago, when I tried to transfer, I fell heavily. Thankfully, other than superficial bruising and a huge, huge blow to my confidence. Um, let's see. Nothing else was broken. If it had been older, I had probably had fracture of bone where to, I guess I get it older. I'm going to have to take a fewer risk to protect myself. Absolutely, Joe. Um, you got away with, you know, not getting hurt, which is thank God. Um, but what do we do to prepare? Well, I'm hoping that as you progress in your injury in your years, you've learned, you become a lot more savvy. Uh, you start understanding some of your limitations. Uh, I, I remember nurse Linda, when we had her, she said, uh, can always exercise, continue to exercise as a big part, do not gain weight. Um, so one and two, they're exercise, don't gain weight. Uh, develop good hobbies that does not rely on your physical ability. And number four, establish a good sense of social support. So I'm, so I have four things I'm already recommending for, for you, you know, right, right off the bat there that unfortunately, I, you know, I've worked so much in my life because of probably an overcompensation of my need to have something meaningful. All I did was work, work, work. And so I didn't see myself exercising very much, which, you know, I, sh I probably should have put more time into that. Um, and I also ate really whatever I wanted to eat for a while. And, uh, and I should have probably watched my diet a little bit better. You know, it's, it's never too late to eat better. Um, but you know, some of those things that the experts recommend as we get older. Now, mentally, mentally, if you were not, you know, most of us actually don't get a, a clinical diagnosis of depression or anxiety. Um, when you have a spinal cord injury, there, there's no, you have to have depression just because you broke 
you know, your back, your neck. But it is higher than the normal population. The injury does elevate the percentage of people who are depressed and anxious from the injury. And so being biased, I would say, look, you got to go get some help. And it's just like if you have the flu, you go to the medical doctor. You know, if you are in lack, lack of meaning in life and you're frustrated and you're aggravated with where you're at, you go see someone, someone that, well, make sure you see someone that knows how to, that has have worked with spinal cord injury uh, because it's, we're very unique. I would say not every psychologist just knows how to treat you. You would have to go to someone who's been trained to work with you. So, so yeah, um, psychologically, you have to be in a better mindset because the things that are coming, being older, does not get easier. It, it seems to actually get a little bit, a little harder. I have, I'm having to use almost all my skills to tell myself, okay, how do I get around this one? How do I figure this one out? You know, what is frustrating me today that doesn't seem to be frustrating me before? You know, I've noticed that, uh, that although I think I'm getting wiser, I still have to feel like I have to do a lot more psychologically than I was younger. Maybe, maybe when I was younger, I was probably a little bit more naive. Um, you know, now I'm less naive and probably hopefully a little more savvier. Um, so, so that, so that's, those, that's my thoughts. Um, all right. We are going to, so those are my comments about aging and progression of aging. So uh, to rehash about aging, so, and this is a little bit linked to the AD stuff is recommendations from a psychological perspective is exercise. And when I say exercise, my question is, is not the exercise itself, but it's usually, are you motivated to exercise? That's where I get involved. You know, what keeps you from going and doing the work? Is it the depression? Is it the anxiety? Is it the lack of su social support? Okay, same thing with diet. You know, what keeps you from controlling your appetite, uh, eating right? Is, that, is it a motivational? Is it, is it a, a lot of us eat because it, need, it fulfills a need. You know, how many of you out there, uh, let me know in the chat, how many of you like to eat when you're stressed? Give me a yes, no on there in the chat of, of people who eat. I, I used to not eat when I used to be stressed. Now, as I got older, I realized, man, I love to eat when I'm stressed. And uh, which is a, not a good thing because I'd rather be the type that not eat when I'm stressed. Um, but uh, yeah, so so physical exercise, diet, okay, um, being prepared, education. You know, I'd be like many of you in here academically, uh, learn about what it is to grow older with a, without disability because those factors are still going to be an issue and then specifically to a spinal cord injury you know how and man during this pandemic uh, it's hard to have that last part the social support you now we're all in the house the only time i get to get out most of the time in the last year and a half is to go grocery shop and that's and that's probably the, one of the worst place to go actually with all the people but there was no other reason to go out um but obviously i'd be masked up and i had my i had my shots already but you know so i feel a little lot, lot safer now than i did but you know it was just like you had to find a reason to get out um so that socialization um was definitely limited for uh, for me so um, so we are going to shift to a, another part of a question here. Um, we are going to see if William is available um, to be on and to ask. 
some ask some questions. Let's see. Can we get William on? Yeah, hi, Dr. John. Hey, hey, William. It's great. Thank you for being on. Sure. Now, William, you know, I was fascinated by the the question that you you brought up when you 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 know when you sent in during the registration. But can you tell us a little bit about yourself that that you're willing, to, you know, your injury, how long, etc. Yeah, I'm a C4 spinal cord injury that I got from a motorcycle wreck. Um, 61 years old. And I'm in my fifth year post spinal cord injury, just about four and a half years past. Um, okay. So, and what, what, what has been the hardest thing about these first few years? You know, it's been so long since I've been had, <laughs> remember those first few years. What's the hardest thing for you that you had to work through in these first few years? Well, for sure, that first year was really hard just getting used to the situation and not, you know, not being able to, to move, you know, being a C4, mm -hmm. uh, I can move my head and neck and shoulders. Mm -hmm. but that's it. I can't move my arms. Okay. And uh, just everything sleeping uh, bowel, bladder, I have a super pubic catheter, mm -hmm. uh, just changing that out and getting UTIs. Oh my God. Just, I, I, just, UTIs. I, it's, 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 they, they never leave. Right. Right. So just going from being a, you know, I'm a tall, thin guy, or at least I was, uh, who never went to the doctor going from that to being someone who's short now sitting in a chair and uh, unable to move and having everything wrong. I got, uh, you know, I went in the hospital right when I got home uh, with some, some lung issues and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, then later I even got cancer. Oh, wow. Uh, supposedly wasn't related to, to the injury, but I feel like with all that radiation I got on my neck, all the MRIs and, and x-rays that it just might have woken the sleeping cancer if it was there. It was right, like, right, um, right. Yeah, between the stress of all this and as well as, yeah, you're right. You, you're, you're radiated a million times because of, they have to take all those different pictures all the time so it woke right. up a little giant in you yeah and so just you know all that sickness was just uh almost overwhelming and it was you know i'm married and it was certainly overwhelming for my wife she's a very strong independent person but um she had to deal with all this with adjusting the house and and getting caregivers and uh, you know, learning how to take care of me. And, and it was just a huge amount of stress on her. And I think at one point she didn't feel like she could take it, you know, and just was, didn't know what to do, but she luckily soldiered on and got through it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're, when one, I think is hurting, is in pain is is you know doesn't know what's going to happen to them they tend to lash out right when they yeah. when you're scared absolutely you lash out and who do you lash out against the people closest absolutely who you, who you love and and boy that's you know i feel so bad about that i did a lot of that in the first six months to a year and um you know it's it's hard for some people to forgive that. So yeah, you never know how that's going to go. Right. Right. You know, it's, 
you know, in, in our situation, it, it just so much, you know, it sounds like you're a real active person being that you, you, you rode a motorcycle and you like to be, I, I always think of motorcycle people as being, being out there and free, that, that freedom of just, just riding with the wind in your hair, you know, that type of concept. And now you're, you're almost closed in, you know, you're stuck in this little part of you that you can't do anything, you know, at least physically. Right. You know, I, I don't know if that's how you were feeling at that time. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, now I'm, I can't move. I mean, whereas I, I did everything before, what, you know, I played tennis, I swam, I surfed, I, uh, you know, worked out. Right, right. So again, you're real, real physically active. I like the surfing part. That's the part where I, you know, I got hurt as well. So uh, I'm with you on that. Can, can you, can you tell me, it's just, you know, the caregiver burden, caregiver stress is, is one of the big areas in our, in our lives because our caregivers always get overwhelmed at times. Can, you said she got over that. How, can you tell me how, or maybe give us some insight a little bit of how she was able to get through that and get over that part of or at least you from know, your perspective? Uh, you know, I don't really know other than she just, um, just, I guess, felt like, you know, this was something she had to do. This was something handed, handed to us and that she just had to get through it. We've been married at that point, just under 20 years. Okay. So it's been a long time, actually. 20 years is a big thing these days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you've been, so you've been around for a long time. You at least been committed for many years. So there's some sense of obligation for each other, right? I think that commitment is probably what got her, got her through. And, and, uh, you know, at, at one point I got a little more stabilized. Mm -hmm. So that made it a little bit easier. Our caregiver situation was really rough in the beginning, going through different people. Yeah, to, yes. You know, they yes. quit. They work for a day and quit. And uh, that stabilized where we got some a really good team of people. Because that was a huge stressor on her. Since yeah, that was because if they didn't show time. up, it, it was on her all the time. Right, exactly. Yeah, she had to come in and do the dig stems and, uh, you know, things that you don't want your wife to do. And really, a wife didn't sign on to do, didn't certainly expect that she'd be doing something like that. So uh, she just is a strong person and got through it. You know, I have to give a shout out to all the caregivers out there. You know, it sounds like you have a great partner there and, you know, and, and, and she and worked through these tough times. You know, my wife used to always threaten me with the baseball bat for a ditch stem if, if I didn't settle down and act right. You know, so I'm just kidding people. I should never actually use a baseball bat, but uh, for the digital stem. But, uh, but uh, for those out there, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard process, the relearning your lives and you had to change how you interact with each other. Um, Mac, am I correct to say that? That you had your roles completely changed for you too? Well, that's, that's exactly right. You know, you you go from husband, uh, wife relationship to a more caregiver patient relationship and Whereas that might normally happen in later life when people get older mm -hmm. and one gets sick and so the other has to take care of them. They got bad cancer mm -hmm. or, you know, had a stroke or whatever mm -hmm. they get when they're, you know, in their eighties, you hope, right. To live that long. Mm -hmm. and so that sort of relationship happens to people, but, you know, at, at our point in, in life, our, we were in our late fifties. We still had a lot of plans. Yes. Traveling and doing all kinds of things. 
our 20 year uh, wedding anniversary was about to come up. It, in fact, it came the month after I got hurt and I had planned a big trip to Italy. That's where we went on our honeymoon. So this was going to be a, uh, you know, a trip back there. And, uh, you know, there I, I blew it huh? a month right before that, that whole trip was planned. But, uh, so yeah, the relationship changes to that caregiver patient and, you know, that's really not necessarily what every spouse has signed on for when they get married. Mm -hmm. Again, maybe later in life, they, yeah, that's normal, you know, in, in sickness and in health, right? So right. you're going to be sick when you're 80. All right, I'll handle that. But hey, what about all this traveling? We're going to retire and play golf and, you know, travel. And yeah. that's not everybody can handle that. And, and they, said, hey, I didn't sign on for this. Adios, you know, I'm out of here. Yeah, and you mentioned it, you know, in your registration that uh, like you see a lot of your friends who were married or who had girlfriends at that time, it doesn't last. You know, it, it, it that the strain of that makes it difficult to work through that. And, and you know, in some ways, fortunately, you guys were together longer most yeah, I've, I have met more than several uh, people that have spinal cord injuries since I've gotten mine and they have gotten divorced and it's exactly that reason, you know, their spouse, they're, they're younger than me when it happened, their thirties, forties. And the spouse was just like, I, you know, I, don't want to do this. I didn't sign up for it. I got my life to live. I can't be a caregiver the rest of my life. And, and they unfortunately get divorced. So I think one reason too, and certainly I notice it is you, you lose intimacy, right? You, mm -hmm. it's not like you can just go up to your spouse and grab them and give them a big kiss when you're sitting in a wheelchair that you have to get someone else to come move for you. That's not a real sexy situation. Yeah. I'm way beyond the kiss in my head. My brain's already flying through my head if I was able body. So um, I'm already 10 step ahead of you there, Matt. So, <laughs> I'm, so I'm with you on that. And yeah, it, that physicality part, definitely is out the door and, and you have to, you know, reconnect in so many different ways that are, that are even more, hopefully more valuable. Um, you know, yeah, the, you know, we talked about that a few months ago that, and that's the area that most of us really don't talk about a lot, especially in rehab. It's almost like, so this uh, discomfort and the professionals don't want to talk about, it, so you don't end up talking about it. And you know, it's only like between you and I, where we're, or you and I, a couple of spinal cords, we hang out with it and maybe we'll be brought up once in a while. But even then, you know, it doesn't get talked about much, right? You know, it, it sort of just, it just exists. And we're sort yeah, of- a sensitive topic. Yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, that's another area of, of quite frustration for you. I can hear that. Yeah, I wondered what your thoughts on that would be. Well, you know, you know my, my thoughts on that is that it, it, you have to be willing to, be flexible, and I don't mean physically flexible. I mean psychologically flexible to try different things, the, the willingness to um, evolve in yourself in different avenues to connect. You know, if it's, it's if it's the gentle touch, if it's the you know spending some time together um, in ways that makes a little more interesting. It's hard to do that when you got caregivers in and out. I mean, I get that. That that there's never privacy. There's never um, you know what. It, my wife always gets out of the bed before the caregivers get, you know, you know in the mornings, she's out, she's, she, she, it's just not comfortable for them to be coming into the house when she's in bed. And I, and those of you care out there to have caregivers come me, let me know if this is something that bothers you because she just got to get out of there before she even, you know, the people even gets in the house because it's just awkward, you know, to, to have to, 
be, you know, in your bag when other people are already coming to help you. Um, now, one of the hardest things I know that for me, it was, it was always timing at night to go into bed, having to be scheduled to go to bed at a certain time. I don't know if that ever be part of your timing process there, Mac. Yeah, that's right. You know, I, um, well, I, I need to be turned at night. Okay. I can't turn myself. And so I have a caregiver overnight. Okay. That is sort of camping out in a little side room of mm -hmm. the master bedroom. And that was just something that my wife couldn't, she didn't want to be there in bed with me with the caregiver coming around every couple hours. Yeah. You know, rolling, yeah that's rolling that's me awkward for everyone, including you. Yeah. I mean, it's awkward. Plus it's disruptive to getting good sleep. Yeah. I'm guessing you're not getting very much sleep in your last few years. Have you? Well, at the beginning, uh, you know, the, the teaching I got was, hey, you got to turn every two hours. And that's what they did at the inpatient rehab. But, um, and at first I did it that way. But then I learned, you know, why am I doing this every two hours when uh, somebody's coming in and waking me up and turning me? I'm going to wake up every two, three, four hours on my own. I'll just call for them to turn me then. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that, that improved my sleep quality quite a bit. Yeah. So you made, you know, and what I like about that psychologically is that you made some adaption, you made it work for you because I know professionals always give these recommendations of, of, of you got it, you know, here, take, you know, take this every two hours or do this every, and the reality that you have to make it work for your life because if it doesn't, then you're going to just go, going to go down the hill. And so you you made it work. You know, I I was in a similar situation, obviously at eight, 19, when I broke my neck and I had to be turned. And finally I said, you know what? I'm just gonna lay on my back with alternating air mattresses. I wanna see if this works. Now I'm not gonna say to, to you out there, all oh, of you should do this. I just did it because I got tired of people turning me every night because my mother had to get up to do it every night. And, and I have to say, my mother worked all day and then come home and stay up all night with me and then went back to work the next. I just had such a guilt with her getting up all night that I, I said, no way, I, I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna try to lay on my back and I'm gonna try to sleep with these alternating air mattresses. And I, and I learned to sleep with doing that way and not having to be turned anymore with the mattress. And luckily the skin stayed intact and I never had to do that again. And I'm not sure if that would make sense to you, Mac, being that you're still, you know, you're young and you're, when it comes to, when I say young, I mean, early on in your, you know, there's, these are some options, alternatives that you should try. Maybe if that is an issue of just wanting to sleep and, you know, but again, make sure you do it with the professional that's recommending and, you know, I have to say those caveat, making sure your skin is, but what I like about what you said was that you, you try to make things adapt to your life and make it right for you. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I have tried to go, all night on my back and and I have sometimes just because I guess I'm really tired and mm -hmm. I've never been turned I'll go eight hours totally asleep so that mm -hmm. happens every now and then but now and then you get a little reprieve from the turn huh so but, you know I, I'm gonna ask you one one maybe one one last question because I had you, I appreciate you being on here for such a long time with us. What is, you know, what is the one positive thing that you are, you figured out how to do or to get through your every day? I mean, I know every day has got to be a struggle with, I, you know, I told a caregiver the other day, it's like, you know, I, I put this, it's just like with you listeners, you know, this is sort of a, we have to put this role or facade on at times because there's no use for me to be sad around everybody. But in my head, most of the time, I'm always 
you know, I'm thinking about things I got to do and things I'm frustrated with. So most of the time it's usually frustrating, but I get some good 20 to 30% of the day being really good. What is those 20, you know, those percent of time when you are doing okay, like what are, what do you do during the day that just make you feel like you're okay for a few minutes or a few seconds? Well, I do a lot of physical therapy. Okay. I still go to outpatient therapy twice a week. And, you know, just like working out, that is a workout for me, right? That's yes. quadriplegic's workout. And, uh, you know, I used to always say even before my injury that the best part of working out is when you're through that's when you feel good. You know, I, I went, I didn't want to go, but I went and I worked out and I burned calories and I, I feel good about myself and, mm-hmm. and I feel good physically and mentally. And so that's definitely uh, a time when I feel good because you, you've been around your physical therapist. Of course, they're all positive and yes yes like, isn't it amazing the people that usually work in rehab they're always really physically fit and they always have great attitudes right and they tell you oh you're doing great you know you you winked your eye that's awesome you know? yes um, yes so I, have that, to ask, I have to ask though what happens when your nose itch though mac i mean <laughs> Because I, I barely could touch my nose and that drives me crazy. So what hap- What do you do when your nose itch? I just got to take it. <laughs> you have to suck it up, Mac? Yeah, till it, it, it'll eventually quit itching. <laughs> but, uh, sometimes I'll say, hey, grab my arm and I got to scratch my nose and, and they'll sort of rub my, or just put my hand to my nose and I can move <laughs> my head side to side scratch it so sometimes i do that well great mac you know i'm running i want to say thank you i have only a few minutes so i'm gonna have to say thank you and and please stay in touch and email me if uh you know as things go progress i want to really appreciate you sharing your your life and experience with us thank you all right no problem thank you thanks man so that was mac and you know c4 first four or five years there you know, you know, I can't even imagine going back that far, being 33 year post. I, I remember that my first year when I met this individual that was four years out and, and he was in college and I was just ready to go thinking about going back to college because I was always in college already the first year I broke my neck and I'm like, you know, my dad's like, you know, you got to meet this guy you know, try to get me to make sure that I can do it. I was already going to do it anyway. But, but when I saw this individual and he said, and he was four years out, I was like, Oh my God, four years out. Holy cow. How do you can, how can you live like that for four years? And I'm not going to be paralyzed that long. Well, I was 30, you know, I, I'm glad I stopped thinking that way because it obviously, paralysis didn't go away and uh i'm 33 years post and i can't imagine you know but then you know now that i've been doing these podcasts and meeting a lot of different people there's so many people out there that are in their 60s 70s i'm hoping i'm hoping i can you know make it up there as well so uh, so i want to uh shift a little bit to answer a question from Suzette. Suzette asked me that, you know, this is a little diff- different shift so that, you know, I work with, Suzette writes that I work with 200 disabled elderly clients in an organization that provides them attendance and rides to medical appointments. We, we focus on helping people live independently and like to hear about the best practices for supporting people during COVID time of isolation, no loneliness. Thank you. Well, Suzette, one of the things that we, you know, we read or we, in literature says that we don't want to assume people are, are going to have issues, uh, although having the COVID at this point has increased the number of people who have having mental health issues. Um, so first, those, we never want to assume they have it, but if they do and they're having the symptoms, then we definitely want to give them some advice and advice that's out there you know we it is 
the anxiety does increase. While we try to counteract that with mindfulness and meditation, um, or some of the recommendations, physical exercise, yoga, and relaxation therapy. Those are the top few that we rec I looked at empirically are the recommendations for people who are anxious and closed off. And uh, so some meditation, some mindfulness, some physical exercise, yoga, and relaxation therapy. Now, if those don't work and, and those doesn't, then obviously we have, we're on Zoom, we're on you know, video conferencing, doctors on demand. You know, we're all available online to have direct counseling. So, you know, let me rehash today. Look, everyone out there, the thing about this podcast, which I hope it makes sense, is that I'm biased towards being a psychologist. I'm biased towards being using your brain. You know, we have a lot of things to deal with from, as Mac indicated, the, the, the caregivers, the intimacy, you know, as Misty indicated, our bodies are changing, you know, we ought to know, you know, dysreflexia. The only thing that's crucial and core to that is your brain. Your brain is gonna be involved in all these ability to accommodate and, and, and to adjust. I hope, I hope that every podcast gives you a little more insight in trying to figure out what to do and to live a, somewhat of a quality of life. You know, I don't want to really f pretend that this is not hard. It is hard. I struggle with it a lot all the time. I tr and it, it's something that doesn't go away. Um, but every day I try to find something great that I can be involved in something. I got a lot of great students uh, that I influence, I hope. And um, I have people like you guys to, that reaches out and and I hope that I make an impact on your lives. And I, and as you hear my dog barking out there, when I work from home, I apologize as Amazon drops something off. So, no, nope. so shout out for Amazon there, I guess, since we need people to dropping things off and they're a great worker. So, um, so let me know how I did. Give me the, you know, answer some of those questions at the end of this. I want to thank you again. I will, you know, this is Dr. John, uh, adjustment through lifespan. I end with talk to me, send me your emails and questions. Thank you again. I'll see you in, in June. Bye-bye.